Hey, this is Chris Kopik for Intagma. I was lucky enough to be one of the beta testers for Moose and Paul's MLOps toolset and the artworks that I ended up publishing alongside the launch were those strange forest point clouds. I got a lot of questions about how I got these results and this is exactly what we'll cover in this video. If this is your first time seeing MLOps, you may want to check out the installation instructions as well as the introduction to text to image and control net, as these are the features we'll be using today. Links are in the description. But now let's take a look at the setup. This is what we'll render in the end. This is a displaced picture of a forest. And we get to there by first of all creating a picture of a forest using the text image workflow in Stable Diffusion 2.1. We also create a depth map of this picture by using the control net conditionings. We use both of them to displace our forest into 3D space. And then in the end, as this looks a bit wonky, we also apply a depth of field effect based on our camera's focal length, focal distance and aperture. This is our quick overview, but now let's jump into a new scene and get going. So inside an empty scene, let's drop down a geo container. Let's dive inside and let's first of all build our text to image workflow. For this, first of all, I need a prompt. So let's use a SD prompt create. And in my case, and let's make some room here, I want a photo of a forest, of a lush green forest. And that photo should be high quality, highly detailed, 8K and beautiful. Let's also create a negative prompt and our first definitely shouldn't be ugly, mangled, bad, disfigured, low detail and cheap like this. Let's wipe both of them into a tokenizer and then in a stable diffusion text encoder like this. Let's build the rest of our text image setup. We need some latent noise. So let's generate some latent noise and I'm fine with this resolution right here. Let's wire those into a scheduler and let's wire this into our MLOps Stable Diffusion Solver. Let's wait a bit to solve. If we hit H on a viewport, we got some latent vectors. Let's decode them into an actual image by using an MLOps image decoder. And now we have a picture of a forest. I don't like this perspective very much, so let's change the seed. And for this image that you saw earlier, I used a seed of three. So this is our forest done. And now let's create the depth map of our forest. For this, again, I want to use a control net conditioning workflow. So let's drop down an MLOps SD control net conditioning node. Let's wire this in. And by default, this is set up to create canny edges, but I want a depth estimation in my case. And after a bit of waiting, this is what I get. Now, right now the depth information is stored inside the CD color attribute, but I want a special depth attribute. So let's use a quick point wrangle to fix this. And we could just write, for example, f at depth is equal to v at cd dot x. But in my experience, these depth maps do seem to have a gamma curve applied, which we don't want. So we need to fix the gamma or make those values linear again. And we can do this by taking our value of cd dot x to the power of something that I want to just control with a slider. And let's call that slider gamma like this. Let's close all the brackets and add some semicolons and let's create the slider and for now let's just set the value to one and tweak this later. Also while we're at it the colors on our main image are a bit washed out and this is also again an issue with the gamma of this picture and this would normally be fixed by using the export image node that comes with the MLOps toolset but in this case I want to be lazy and I again want to apply a sort of gamma curve using a point wrangle. So wire this in on this side Let's set our v at cd equal to our v at cd set to the power of, again, a float slider. Like this. And if we set this to 1, we get the exact same result. But if we, for example, set this to a value of 2, we get a nice and more contrasty image, which I prefer in this case. Of course, you can skip this step and just color grade your renderings later. But I chose this route right here. Now we have our depth information here, our color information here, and we want to transfer our depth information to our color image. 
So let's first of all make both of these images the same size by using a match size node where it is first of all under image and let's check scale to fit and let's again hit age on a viewport to see what we're doing and let's just copy this and do the exact same thing for a depth map and then let's use an attribute transfer to get a depth map onto our main color image by wiring both of these inputs in and then selecting our depth attribute as the attribute that we want to transfer. Now let's finally use a depth value to distort our points on our main image. So for this, let's first of all use a transform node to rotate our image. Let's rotate around the Z axis a value of minus 90 degrees. And now let's use another point wrangle to displace our points. And we want to displace our points by taking our V at P vector and adding to it another vector which should be a depth value on the x-axis and zero and zero on the y and z-axis, like this. Now we have a depth estimation of a forest and we can now tweak the gamma values up here to get a nicer result by slowly decreasing the gamma value to even this out and maybe a value of 0.66 is fine. Also we got some artifacts in our depth map and we can either decide that we lack those artifacts and we want to keep them, but in my case I want to just blur them out. And for this, before a point wrangle, let's use an attribute blur. Let's set the attribute that we want to blur to depth and let's choose the influence type by proximity. And let's make a value here a whole lot smaller, a value of 0.005, the rest is fine. Well, also uncheck pin border points. And now if we take a look, at the before and after, we can see that our weird artifacts are gone. So almost done. The last step that we want to do is to apply a fake depth of field effect. And for this, first of all, I need a focus plane. And for a focus plane, I obviously also need a camera. So let's jump back to OBJ level. Let's pick a nice view and let's control click on a camera icon. And for my camera, for the final artwork, I chose a resolution of 1024 by 1024 square resolution and also a focal length of 80 millimeters. And let's pick a nice view of a forest, maybe something like this. And this is our camera and our scene. Let's jump back into our main setup and let's create a focus plane that matches our camera. So for this, I want to start out with a grid. For this grid, I want to have two rows and two columns and I want to leave the size at 10 by 10. But I want to imagine for a second or pretend that this plane is living inside the camera coordinate space and I can do exactly that by setting this to the XY plane and moving the center to a value of 0.5 and 0.5 and the C value should be a negative focus distance. So for this let's jump back to our camera, get into the sampling tab, let's right click on our focus distance, let's copy the parameter. And in here, let's paste the relative reference. And again, this should be the negative focus distance. So let's add a negative sign in front of this expression like this. And now this is set to minus five, which is what I want. Now we want to get those imaginary camera coordinate space coordinates into a world coordinate space. So for this, let's use a point wop. And inside our point wop, we have a function called from NDC, which is exactly doing what I want. So let's first of all make sure we have the right camera selected right here. And let's wire in a P attribute into this node and a P attribute again out of this node. And now if we merge for now both our input streams together right here and jump back out and select our camera and zoom out a bit and adjust a focus distance. We get some weird errors. Let's take a quick look at why those. And I chose the YZ plane, but I want the XY plane, this one. And now we got an accurate focus plane. And if I again adjust the focus distance, I can see this focus plane moving through my object. So let's zoom in a bit and let's maybe get the focus on this tree right here. So let's finally adjust this. In my case, a value of 1.2 seems fine. So we got a focus plane. Now let's calculate a blur value for each point and the distance to this focal plane. So for this, let's first of all get rid of our merge node and instead let's use another point wrangle when both our points and our focus plane. And now let's take a look at what we want to write in here. 
We of course could fake this, but in this case I think it's more fun to take a overly scientific approach and what I want to do in the end is I want to calculate the circle of confusion of each point. What is the circle of confusion? Well, let's for a second imagine that we have a very, very tiny light source. And if we take our camera and we focus exactly on this light source, well, our tiny light source is also very tiny on our sensor of our camera. But if we focus in front or back this tiny light source, well, things start getting blurry. And because of that, we don't get a tiny point, we get a circle. And this circle is the circle of confusion. And what my plan is, is for every point, calculate its own circle of confusion and then displace it to a random position on a sphere with exactly this radius. There's a formula that we can use, this little handy diagram in here. This right here is the sensor, this right here is the lens, and this is a focus plane, and this is the object we are photographing. And again, what comes out in the end is this tiny distance right here at the end, which is a circle of confusion. Now, in our case, we actually don't need to care about the exact circle of confusion. We actually want to care more about this auxiliary blur circle right here in front. And this is actually quite nice because we can use this very simple formula down here. So taking first of all the absolute of our object distance minus our focus distance and dividing this again by object distance and then multiplying this by our aperture. Now unfortunately this aperture right here is the actual size of our aperture, not our f-stop, but this is also quite easy to calculate by just taking the formula of our focal length and our aperture size and this gets us our f stop n, and we can of course switch around this formula to calculate our aperture size from our focal length and our f stop. So lots of explanation, let's now jump into Houdini and implement this. We first want to get all the values from a camera that we care about, so let's grab first of all a focus distance, which in the diagram is called S1, and this should be equal to a channel float, and let's call it focus underscore distance. We also want the f-stop, let's create a variable for this as well. And again, this should be a channel float called f-stop. And lastly, we need a focal length, so let's create a variable called fln. And again, this is equal to a flow channel called focal length. Let's link all these values to our camera, so let's create our sliders first of all, and then let's create some relative references. So for a focus distance, I want to create a channel reference, and this should jump out of this node out of the next node, jump into our cam1 and then grab a parameter called focus, like this. Next for our f-stop, let's again create a channel, jump out of this node, jump out of the next node, jump into our camera1 and let's grab the f-stop and for focal length again a channel reference, out of this node, out of the next node, into our cam1 and the parameter that we're looking for is called focal. This should be all done and these should be also our correct values, which they are. So let's implement the formula that we found earlier. First of all, let's calculate our aperture diameter, which in a formula is called capital A, and this is our focal length divided by our f-stop, like this. Then we want to calculate our S2 value, and our S2 value is our focus distance plus the distance from a point to a focal plane. So let's calculate this. Float S2 is equal to S1 plus the distance of our current point's position and the position on the closest point on the focal plane. And for this, we can use the min pause function and check on our input one from our current point's position like this. And then our actual formula for the circle of confusion or the blur circle, let's call it capital Z as in the diagram, and this is equal to aperture size times, open parentheses, the absolute, open parentheses, of our S2 minus our S1, divided by S2, and this is a formula done. And now to finally displace our points, we first of all want to generate a random vector, so vector rand is equal to a random function, where we put in our 
pt num. Now all three values of this vector are between 0 and 1, and we want them to be between minus 1 and 1. So rent is equal to fit, and let's use a fit 0, 1 function for this. And we want to put in our rent value again, and a vector of all minus 1s, and a vector of all 1s as an output. And right now what this value gives us is a unit cube, but we want a unit sphere. So for this, let's finally normalize our rand value again. So this is our random position on our sphere. And now finally, let's set our VHP, or let's take our VHP and add to this our random position on our sphere times a blur circle. And since this blur circle is a value in millimeters, let's also divide this by 1000 to get values in meters, which Houdini wants, and let's add parentheses around it. Now, this should be done. We should see a tiny bit of blur appear on our model right here. Let's jump back out. Let's maybe jump into a camera. Let's maybe make some room here. Let's also go into our display options by hitting D. Let's go to background. Let's set this to dark. And let's also go to geometry and play with our point size until this looks nice. And now we can close this. We can go into our camera and for example, play with the S-stop and we should see a blur increasing. And we can also play with a focus distance to get different parts of image and focus. And of course, we can just lock our camera to a view and just take a look through our scene. And in the end, to render this out, since this gets really, really close to the final image that I want, I actually don't want to bother with any actual rendering engine. In this case, I actually just rendered out a flipbook from my viewport. Or you could also use the OpenGL node as well. But this is it for today. I hope you like this first MLOps setup. And until next time, it's cheers and goodbye.